Hello, welcome to Gardens Through History. I'm Hazel Gardner, a keen horticulturist and floral designer. In this series, I'll be visiting some of the most fascinating English heritage gardens around the country. I'll be learning about their history, chatting to the gardeners that maintain them, and finding out how every garden keeps faithful to the historic origins. I'll be sharing some top tips inspired by historical gardening for you to try at home. Coming up in this episode, I visit Elton Palace in South East London, one of the best examples of an arts and craft garden in the grounds of a stunning Art Deco house. I also meet the team behind restoring and maintaining the site's Seely and Paget Design Gardens, as well as exploring a brand new special addition to the stunning grounds. Before I get started on the modern day Elton Palace, I'm eager to learn about the incredible history. For that, I'm chatting to senior garden advisor, Christopher Weddell. Hi Christopher. Hi Hazel, welcome to Elton Palace. Oh, thank you so much, it is glorious. It's wonderful, isn't it? So tell me a little bit about um, Elton. When and why did it come to be? Oh, well, Elton has such a long, rich history. It appears in the Doomsday Book, but I think the, the true foundation of the site was probably in about the 1300s. It was the childhood home of Henry VIII. And yes, one could imagine this court, the moat walls were higher, there were many more buildings, um, but there was a magnificent deer park. It was probably about the second largest royal park if it was still in existence today. And it was enjoyed for hunting. So at the beginning of its life, it really had a, a rich history. There was, you know, lots going on here. But then something kind of happened. What happened? It was abandoned. Well, it became out, uh, fell out of fashion a bit. Um, Henry VIII much preferred um, Hampton Court and did uh, many works there and is a magnificent palace and one can, can see why. Over time uh, they would come and enjoy the hunting grounds but they could reach it from, from Greenwich. So the buildings fell out of use, they weren't maintaining it so well, it was more fashionable to go to um, other palaces and it gradually deteriorated. Uh, the civil war then interrupts, it becomes a base for parliamentarian um, forces. By the 18th century it was had agricultural uses, so it was farmed. The buildings were used for agricultural equipment and storage and, and, and animals and those sorts of things. It was handed over to uh, what was then um, the Office of Works and then the Ministry of Works to, to look after it. So luckily, a couple, a very rich couple, <laughs> um, took a fancy to it. Tell me about the courtards who are fascinating in themselves. The courtards are, are just amazing. Um, I think they were looking for a, a country pad. They had lots of horticultural friends. They liked traveling. They liked the open spaces. And I think they were looking probably for a luxurious home or an estate they could turn into their luxurious home. And they took out a 99 year lease from uh, the Crown Estate. They employed Celia and Paget as the architects to design their house and they moved in in 1936. What changes did they actually make to the grounds and the gardens? The changes were quite sub substantial and we do have a wonderful record of photographs taken by the architects of before their works and then after. And it is quite telling the amount of work that was, was taken place. They'd obviously travelled well and I think they were looking for a fashionable garden. But actually we've got this wonderful um, cine film and you can see them enjoying the garden. So I think they, it was personal choices that they were making. We have um, country life um, photos of tulips, which we know that uh, were planted widely in the spring. We can tell from some aerial shots later that um, dahlias during the summer were the thing for the bedding. Stephen Courtauld um, had his, his influences as well. He loved climbing in the Alps. So um, I think he was into his alpine plants. And I think this rock garden is about the detail of big rocks and small plants. And I can imagine him taking his horticultural friends round of an evening before dinner, going and looking at the plants that they would have perhaps seen on their expeditions, their, their journeys in the Alps and the like, and actually seeing them here at, at Eltham. The palace is very much an art deco and some of that of course bleeds out into the design of the landscape. But I think that they were wanting to make use of the fact that they had a wonderful site here. They had the, the bones of all of the medieval moat and um, walls and things like that. So they had their framework, which in the arts and crafts style they wanted to augment, they wanted to use to the advantage. And it was very much of the character in those times to, to do that. Incredible. So there really is so much history in this garden, so much for visitors to see. Oh yes. Um, there's some Thing every day of the year. I might be a bit biased, but it is one of my favourite sites. It is spectacular. Um, now, I think I have to go off and do a little bit of deadheading. Yes, I think Karen's got some hard work for you. Oh, I'm ready. <laughs> 
see you soon. Take care. The influence of the Courtauld family can be felt throughout the grounds of Elton Palace, but maintaining this appearance is a careful balance of historical accuracy and horticultural skill. To get some insight into how this takes place, I'm meeting with head gardener Karen Clayton. Hi Karen! Hello! Oh, so nice to see you in this incredible sunken rose garden here at Eltham. Oh, it's lovely to have you here. So, you are deadheading. I am, yes. Which yeah. a lot of people know the term, but they might not understand exactly what it means. The purpose of deadheading is to tidy up the border and also to encourage the energy to um, be diverted into the blooming rather than um, creating, producing hips. Mm -hmm. There's two ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's many ways of doing it, but the two ways that you can, you can uh, simplify it mm -hmm. is um, you can snap off the dead heads. Now, what we're working with here are hybrid musks and they're cluster roses, so they're, flower they're very floriferous mm -hmm. and that there's lots of flowers on one stem. So when you look at it here, we've, we've really got to take away the whole cluster. You don't want to just uh, remove one or two. Um, if you were going to remove just one or two, you could do a method which is just snapping off. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go in and you, you just literally break off the buds. Mm -hmm. Like so. It's quite time consuming as you can see. Yes, especially with a plot like this. <laughs> yes, very much. So the other technique to use is um, to prune out the stem. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say pruning, we're not pruning to reduce um, or change the shape of the shrub. We're pruning to dead head. Mm -hmm. So you're taking a single stem and you're looking for where the vegetative growth is, which is marked out by either a growing sheet yes. or a five leaflet um, node of leaves here. So you can look at the stem mm -hmm. and then we know we're going to take that one out. Look for where the vegetative growth is. Um, somewhere around all. So here we go, we can make the cut here. So you're removing all of this. And what people may not know is that roses have a second flush. So they'll have their first bloom and then they'll have their second flush. So this is essential for that, for, for that second bloom to keep going. So for this one, obviously all of this has like gone over. So I'm going to do the cut there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it might seem like people might watching might go, oh my goodness, it's ruthless, but it really is giving that energy back into the plant. Yeah. And so with these roses, is there, do you use supports? Is there anything that people need to know in terms of structures to kind of keep a display like this upright? Well, with these, ro these are shrub roses, so they're self-supporting. Um, if you prune these correctly in, in March, uh, February, March, and you get to the right height, which is around 50, 40, 50 centimetres um, from ground level, um, the arching stems are self-supporting and, and also where they're quite closely um, planted as well, they're, they're creating this sort of framework themselves. Uh, when, if you leave them to grow too tall, you are getting, uh, then you're getting sprays of stems sort of falling over onto the path, which is what we want to avoid. So a really good um, hard prune every year um, is essential because then the plant has its own framework, it develops its own framework to, to hold itself. What are some of the roses that we actually see here in the sunken garden? What are the varieties of people at home wanting to kind of get them for their Choose own house? Them. Yeah, they, so we've got hybrid musks and hybrid teas here. And um, these were fashionable in the 1930s. Um, they're highly scented and on a warm day, you really it really hits you as you walk in this garden, the scent. And this is um, supported as well by the lavender. We've got the English lavender, which planted on the outside. What's your favourite part of the garden? I know that's a really hard question to ask, but if you had to pick one, is there a favourite part of the grounds? Really, for me, it's the vistas here mm -hmm. and just catching these little areas that just, they capture you and it's sort of like a private moment yeah. with the garden and the space. And there are quite a few of those as well, but I'm not going to give you all my secrets. I know, I have to discover them for myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll give you these back. And yeah, good luck with all your deadheading. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. I hope you've really enjoyed my visit to Elton Palace Gardens today. I want to share with you some of the top gardening tips that I found out. Make sure that you plan your year ahead. It's really vital that you know exactly when to plant, when to prune, or when to consolidate. 
If you can view your garden from above, that view will give you a much better understanding of exactly where to plant. Don't forget to prune your roses. They can be really pruned back hard between the first and second flush of flowers to really invigorate the growth. Don't forget to subscribe by pressing the button below if you've liked what you've watched today.